dia do Rio de Janeiro. Boa tarde para nossos uh, participantes de, do Reino Unido. Uh, é um grande Good prazer afternoon. de receber to 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 our our último guests to from to England. To um, it's uh, great for you all to be here for our last webinar, the fourth in the series. We're going to have it in Portuguese and English. We've got simultaneous translation. So hopefully it will be possible for you to interact with our speakers um, by asking them questions. You can put any questions you'd like in the chat. It's great pleasure to be able to finalize this series of four, um, which are conversations about um, methodologies of how to risk assess cultural heritage in various countries, uh, Asia, Africa, and um, we've been there in the past, and today we're going to be returning to Brazil, and we're in the company of some great experts in this field um, in terms of risk assessment. How can we risk assess, and how can we talk about the role of um, cultural heritage as a form of resilience and resistance? We could be talking about climate change and other environmental risks. So today we have a variety of people taking part from anthropologists, social anthropologists to engineers. I'm from the scenic art, so it's always a great pleasure for me to, um, to hear this know-how um, from other people. It was originally financed by the Culture Ministry um, from the UK and the Research Councils from the UK. And our idea is the following. During the last three years, we've had lots of conversations between um, countries and artists and so on to try and understand the role of um, and the risks to cultural heritage. So we're going to celebrate our partnership today with the Fundação Getúlio Vargas, which is, they're a huge partner of us, this foundation in Brazil. And they're a huge um, partner as well with Queen Mary University in London. University of London, rather, which is where I work, and um, I was honored to be able to establish a research centre called People's Palace Project. So we're going to be together in this webinar. So I'm going to ask Fabiana to take over from here. Thank you very much, Paul, and good morning to everybody here in Brazil, and good afternoon to those of you in the UK or other parts of Europe. As Paul mentioned, today we've got a special, um, the special participation of two um, people from the FGV Foundation, and we've also got um, Dr. Ashraf from Durham University in, in the UK, Afresh Osman. And so I think um, we're going to hear some lots of interesting and diverse information from places, but also we're going to look at the points in common. So we're going to ask um, now um, Mariana Makini to start talking. She's doing a doctorate in social anthropology at USP University. Um, she has a master's in social anthropology, and she's worked for 20 years in um, qualitative and quantitative research. She's been a researcher at the Fundação Getúlio Vargas for four years, and she's worked on projects to survey and assess the socioeconomic damage caused by the collapse of the Fundão Tailings Dam in Mariana, in Minas Gerais. And they're going to be talking a little bit about this particular project today. And alongside Mariana, we have Natalia Lucci, who's from the Senaki University Center. She's a master, she has a master's in climate, climate studies from Wageningen University in Holland. And she's a, um, she's a researcher um, at the Center for Studies into Sustainability at the FGV, uh, where she contributes to developing and applying social valuation, sociocultural cultural valuation methods. And she leads a community of practices um, 
regarding the integration of ecosystem services into business management. So, first off, we're going to speak to Mariana and Natalia about this project. Um, it's the Rio Dorsi project, the River Dorsi project. And then we will talk to Ashraf Osman after that. So, over to you, Natalia and Mariana. Thank you very much, Fabiana. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation, too. We're very pleased to be here and to show the results of the work that we've done over the last four years. Uh, we've got um, a huge team of people involved in this, and we also involve the people who have been affected by this dam burst as well. So. We've got a presentation that we'd like to show you. Thank you very much. So we're going to talk a little bit about the work we've done with the Tupini Guarani indigenous peoples in Espírito Santo State and look at the um, damage that was done to, in the immaterial and material damage that was done to this area. So let's go on to the next slide. So this is the context of the dam burst. Shows you the extent. And on that first map, you can see how um, the weight um, went down to the sea. So this dam burst happened um, um, some years ago, and it was San Marco Mining Company that was running the dam. Um, but it, it, it meant that 600 kilometers, the waste from here spread over, sort of rather went downstream 800 kilometers and then spread into the sea, affecting many of the um, Tupi Guarani communities in that area. It was 43 million cubic meters of waste. And this kind of socio-economic disaster is the worst mining dam burst in the world. But, um, also because of the wide extent of people who were affected, of regions that were affected, the animals and the plants that were contaminated and the environment too. And these, this damage was generated and even over time some of these situations get worse it doesn't finish the day that this disaster happens um, it's a process and it's um, that's very serious and can even get worse so here we can see on this slide um, some of the areas that have got worse as a result of this it affected dozens of different municipal um, authorities. Sorry, it's a bit difficult to hear because of the dog um, in the background. And you, but this map basically shows the extent of the damage that was caused by the um, mining dam burst. This slide looks at the main sort of markers over time um, for our project. So it, it was undertaken by teachers and students to look at the damage that has been caused by the disaster. We're talking about the damage to the lives of these populations that were affected. Um, five different schools from FGV were involved in this, um, including um, human rights, um, the applied math school, a microeconomy school as well, and uh, the law school as well. So FGV got involved in this 
because in 2017, um, the federal ministry and the prosecutor's office, that is, and the local one, decided that it was necessary to guarantee um, the safety of this region, and, and they commissioned a number of independent studies, um, and so they called many independent institutions to do this um, assessment of the risks. Um, so it happened on the 5th of November in 2015. Then in March 2016, we signed this firm of agreement, um, which explained the project and the damage that was made and the reparation process. After that, in the same year, we had a public action that was a public lawsuit that was um, taken out um, that estimated the damage. It's kind of a controversial subject how much the damage, how much damage caused by them. They estimated it in 155 billion reais. Then a, the Fundação, the Renova Foundation, was created in June 2016. Um, which is when um, independent experts were called in to carry out these assessments, including FGV. After this, we had a an addendum to our contract, which is called the preliminary um, agreement, which is um, which was exactly um, the means that was that was developed to be able to hire these independent experts. But the actual work itself only started very recently. It's very controversial. It's very difficult, and um, the reparation that has so been, far been offered is um, very much below what should. Um, should be offered. So it was only in February 2019 when FGV actually started to carry out this um, assessment work. So now we're going to talk about different work that we've um, carried out. We've um, carried out work in 45 different local authorities. And these, um, the damage actually hasn't stopped yet. It ends up sort of having new consequences and uh, and it may well be that other um, local authorities um, will ask us to carry out an assessment with them. So, in all the different places um, where we carried out um, this kind of assessment, within the Tupininkim and Guarani um, peoples, we had a completely different process of making this assessment. So, as I said, this, this term agreement um, guaranteed that um, a technical consultancy firm would be hired to study the different components of this disaster that relate to indigenous peoples. So, the idea was to carry out a survey of the damage caused, and not just to the um, community, the indigenous community, but also um, to the environment. Our objective in this was to understand and, and sort of go more deeply into this issue of the damage caused by this disaster within these um, communities. So we um, carried out a process of evalu evaluating the damage caused so that we could um, uh, then develop our work. Carry on to the next stage, next slide rather. So this is another map of the plume of waste as it um, expanded into the sea. You can see that this is the estuary of the river Dorsi um, into the Atlantic Ocean, very close to a community called Sedma Cortegencia. And below the estuary is where the indigenous villages are that you can see in green Tupi Guarani um, communities. Bom, 
Bom, então, é, o, esse município de Aracruz, né, esse município litorâneo, ele é, so ele this é onde 12 municipality of Aracruz um, is where 12 então, of these villages are based Guarani, from the Tupini in Guarani. Communities. So we're talking about Guarani Nyandeva and Guarani Mbia. Um, and the limits of their lands were basically um, formalized in 2004 and 2010. Um, so we've got three indigenous territories, Comboios, Tupiniquim, and Caieres Velha. And these people have been forced to sort of like live alongside a series of different um, enterprises, industrial enterprises, since the mid 1960s, talking about Aracruz de Lourdes, the um, highway ES 10. This highway goes through the um, indigenous territories. And there's an there's the amount of traffic has obviously gone up as a result of that. Um, there's been um, there's been speculation as well by petrol price in the area and also Victoria to Minas as well that um, that was established in the 80s um, and it goes very close to the um, indigenous territories. Okay, so in this next slide we can see the maps of these indigenous lands and in this first map we can see in pink, the Tupiniquim villages, and in yellow, the Guarani villages. And we can also see a village that has the two different indigenous peoples, which is the one that's uh, half yellow and half purple. And in this second slide, we can see the Comboios indigenous land. So these indigenous people have a strong relation with the surrounding urban areas. The Tupiniquim people do a lot of work outside of their villages. And there are some different uh, Guarani specificities that, that in term, because they maintain their natural language. Some people from Gua the Guarani village don't speak Portuguese, but still, they have a lot of relation to the surrounding areas. They depend on the economic activities of the surrounding areas, but they also carry out activities that are linked to the ecosystem, such as fishing, uh, fishing of shellfish, handicraft, uh, the raising of animals, and they also do work at schools, they do domestic work, and they work in civil construction in the villages and also in the surrounding areas. Now I'd like to give the floor to Natalia, who will talk a little bit about our methodology of work, that is the methodology of valuation. Hi, good morning, everyone. I would like to thank everyone for the invita this invitation. So based on what Mariana talked to you about in terms of the context and the characterization of the Tupiniquim and Guarani people of Aracuz, I like to talk about the non-monetary valuation that we were going to do as part of our studies. So we wanted to do a participatory study and we wanted to reach the people that were affected by the disaster and we wanted to raise data, uh, collect data and understand the dimension of the damage to these people. So for that, we sought various alternatives, various different methods. And as Mariana mentioned, we ended up, in this first case, uh, we ended up choosing the non-monetary valuation method, uh, which is also called the social cultural valuation method of ecosystemic services. And that's because these methods brought the immateriality of the relations between these people and their ecosystems that were affected and the ecosystems that were affected. So why did we choose this method? Well, Polyphonica, as Mariana mentioned, was already doing a collection 
uh, an assessment of the damage uh, caused the indigenous lands, and they used a concept that was well received by the indigenous people. We also understood that we needed to get to capture the more immaterial aspect of the damage of the, to these assets because it's common for us to talk about the loss of income and the loss of homes, but there's an important immateriality context. So so we wanted to look at the immaterial aspects of the lives of these people, such as heritage, spiritual identity, landscape beauty and recreation. So in trying to understand the damages to these aspects, we looked at uh, the different uh, non-monetary valuation methods, and there are a lot of different methods available, and so we ended up choosing to do a collective uh, participation of, uh, a, a, yeah, a collective participation of uh, assessment. So we did some interviews and everything worked out okay. So here we have a little bit of the process. So we started with a documental analysis, which was the ECI that uh, Mariana mentioned, which was the indigenous component study. And we looked at some other documents that dealt with the disaster and the history of the of these indigenous people in Aracruz. And we also did some work uh, to work more closely with the chiefs of these indigenous people, and we did this together with the federal prosecutor's office. So with this, first of all, we did a process to try and understand the, and assess the damages that were present in the Polyphonica document. And then after that, we wanted to do workshops to understand the dimensions and in order to try and qualify the damage. That is, we wanted to understand the amount of immateriality of the damages. So we started doing workshops. And you're going to see later on that there's a cycle involved. And so we've got monetary and non-monetary uh, damage assessment. So we started with workshops, then we started doing online surveys and online interviews. And the idea was, first of all, to translate the damages that were validated by the indigenous chiefs into legal damages so that these damages could be used in a legal case with the federal prosecutor's office. And in order to do this non-monetary evaluation, in order to do this non-monetary evaluation, we hired indigenous researchers. So we had eight people who belonged to that area and who lived in that area. These were young people, and they participated with us in this research. So we started training them because we wanted to explain to these people what ecosystemic uh, services were, and that we wanted to tell them about non-monetary evaluation. And they also talked to us about their context. And based on this conversation, we were able to do uh, this non-monetary evaluation online. So we had some interviews where we were trying to understand the immateriality of the damage. So the hiring of these indigenous researchers was very relevant because first of all, they gave us context and secondly, because they were able to map out the important agents in this process. So people with distinct knowledge, uh, the, the elderly people of the villages. And Mariana, you know, told us about how some of the Guarani people didn't even speak Portuguese. So we even had, you know, some translation going on in the interviews. And that was really interesting for us to be able to access all of this knowledge from far away. And all of this was so that we could consolidate and give support to the federal prosecutor's office in their negotiations with the companies. So the objective of this, this non-monetary evaluation was to identify, register, and qualify the importance of immaterial damages. And this was supposed to complement the different 
valuation methods. So there was a monetary valuation, there was an assessment of the different health indicators. And the objective was to have this be something participatory. So we wanted to follow the guidelines established in the conduct adjustment agreement. And this involved bringing together the affected people. So the objective was to contribute and give visibility to these social cultural damages because in these lawsuits that involve compensation, there is a lot of focus on compensation and on financial compensation and material compensation. So we wanted to register and qualify all of the immaterial damages in order to ensure that the reparation would go beyond this compensation. So the results of this valuation contributed to research related to the jurisprudence of moral damages. It's always very difficult to quantify moral damages. So our idea was to bring elements so that this jurisprudence research could try to find new resources or new references. So to do this non-monetary valuation, we used this triangulation of three methods. So we had conversations of, with the affected people, like I said, we had interviews, we had the broad documental research, and we also had a panel with specialists. So we brought together groups of scholars and researchers uh, who were experts uh, in, uh, in relation to those areas. And this allowed us to bring also this academic knowledge from outside. So these experts were not the indigenous uh, researchers that were involved in our process. They were outside scholars. And so we got to hear from these people who knew a lot about this area. So this was the triangulation that we did. This next slide shows us some pictures of these moments uh, uh, where we were working with them in person. And now we're going to talk about the results. So what did we get in terms of results from these non-monetary evaluations? So here we've got the meetings with the federal prosecutor's office. This slide here includes a picture that we like a lot. These were the results that came out from our first in-person workshop. So here we can have the, we see the damages that were validated by the village chiefs. And this picture shows us how the river was basically the most important part of this tree. So that river permeates all aspects of these people's lives and it brings a lot of benefits, both material and immaterial benefits. So these benefits are shown in different colors. So you have cultural in blue, food in green, and income in, and subsistence in white. And the indigenous people thought that this analogy was very interesting. That is, the river, there's this idea that the river feeds the different parts or the different dimensions of the lives of those people. And so it's vital to those peoples, both the river and the sea, because because these people also use the coastal areas of their territories. So we have both the rivers and the coastal area is being important for these people. So to present these results, we divided everything into different dimensions. So we have all of those different colors in that picture, but they're all interlinked. So the main challenges involve separating all of those damages into different boxes. Some of those issues fit into 
different thematic axes. But in order to describe and qualify, and in order to bring images and narratives, it was important for us to do this analysis. So that's why we ended up separating all of those items into these six axes. So here we have traditional practices and the transmission of knowledge, food, income and subsistence, leisure, happiness, celebration, spirituality, and social relations. So we're going to talk a little bit about each one of these themes to show you this to show you the results that we got. In our in our report, we bring narratives the narratives of the people that were affected. We also have bibliograph bibliographical research and secondary data in order to corroborate what was being said by the people who were affected by this disaster. And we also include images and links to videos that were produced by the people who were affected by the disaster. And these videos and pictures showed shows how these people's lives were before the disaster. And it showed the relations of these people with the rivers and with the sea. So we're going to go through the results more quickly because the result is a, is a sociological qualification. So here we have some pictures that we use as a basis for our report. So we have pictures related to traditional practices and the transmission of knowledge. So here we can see the Samburá basket, a notebook uh, with information about medicinal plants of the Tupiniquim people. We have picture a picture of children learning about fishing and the transmission of knowledge it was very important because people here were learning about how they could no longer fish as a result of the disaster. We have here a picture of a play being done about the hunting being done by young people. We've got the removal of taboa for handicraft work. We've got pictures related to their food. So we have pictures of cooked crab, which is a typical Tupiniquim dish. And Mari, do you want to compliment what I'm saying? Yeah, here we have children showing a fish uh, that was caught. And this was something that was very common. You would have children coming together to go fishing and to cook the fish at the beach. So here we have an example about how food is linked to recreation. We've got this one here related to income and subsistence. There were indigenous people who worked in the cities, but there were other people who, but there were other people who were involved in activities within villages that also provided income, such as fishing, fishing both for subsistence and to sell to people outside the village. We've got handicraft work. And there's also the thematic uh, Piracu village, which receives tourists and that shows us these practices. So these are some of the results. So just to complement what Natalia said about the different branches. So leisure and um, happiness is to do also with their celebrations because they've got a calendar of lots of different cele celebrations um, which are part of their traditional cultures but, but also um, they also um, hold these with non-indigenous communities and have done for um, many years. So these festivals after the after the dam burst 
Um, you know, these celebrations have been really, have really suffered because they're meant to be moments of communities coming together and of, um, you know, sort of effective ties and also for pre preparing um, food and also showing indigenous culture to non-indigenous people. So, you know, they, they go to schools in the region. But um, these traditional um, celebrations have suffered a lot, and also traditional medicine has suffered a lot too. Um, and also the the sea life, the marine life as well, um, has suffered. As, there's been a reduction in the number of people visiting the aldeas, the villages, and it has affected their happiness and their motivation. If we carry on to the next slide, please. So, um, they've got a great diversity of cosmology, um, these indigenous peoples, in terms of their spirituality. But, but um, spirituality and religion is very um, important to them. There's an in physical interaction with um, the area, with nature. They, you know, take, um, they bathe, purify themselves in the river, in the sea. There's also a relationship to their food. And um, as Natalia just mentioned, there's a lot of um, sort of uh, these involved relationships and living together with um, other people, with their families, and so on. And uh, happiness is something that is very important to them. So this has been very much affected by the dam burst. And then finally, if we look at the um, social relations slide, you can hear, see, hear a group, a family. Um, but obviously, social relations is part of every other axis that we've talked about, whether we talk about craft, whether it's to do with the celebrations, whether it's to do with storytelling, or whether it's to do with um, claiming, defending their rights. There are so many expressions that involve social relations. And all of this has suffered as a result of the disaster. So they've had to re-signify a lot of, of, of their practices, but they have suffered their ability to come together, to celebrate, and has been affected. It's also affected their education and learning, you know, of how um, knowledge is passed down from generation to generation. So it has affected their sense of collectivity very profoundly. And then just to wrap up, this report did not just uh, measure the tangible and intangible um, damage, but it also looked at the uh, uh, measuring the damage in terms of then seeing the issue of a of compensation, but it was also so the, the foundation Henova have used these parameters of values um, as part of a compensation claim. And and we're talking here not about a compensation for people individually, we're talking about a collective compensation um, that the Fundação Pen Nova is trying to um, um, manage or to get. So, so of the different um, 
uh, peoples, indigenous peoples, Comboyo's um, indigenous territory was meant to be the, was supposedly the one that was most badly affected because um, it has a an irrigation channel that is linked to the river Dorsi. So it's much clearer the how badly this disaster has affected their territory. Um, but it meant that the other indigenous territories found it difficult to prove that they had been, um, they have suffered, they've been affected. So, so we decided to try and help them and to be able to quantify this and um, use this in their case. And as we know, it's very important for us to record all these conversations, the um, interviews that were given, and so on, to be used for, um, in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Natalia, Mariana. I'll switch to English now. Thank you, Natalia. Um, before I Mariana. welcome Dr. Ashraf, um, Osman, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your presentation. It was um, brilliant to see how you designed this participatory method of valuing or how to value the intangible, so the intangible heritage. And we've been talking along this. Um, series of webinars about how intangible damages, they are about identity, about people, about um, how people live traditionally in their communities. And, and I thought it was so great to see how you went beyond the monetary restitu um, restitution to include, you know, um, the, or determine or measure leisure, but joy and happiness as well. Uh, that and their relations, how people live and in, in relation to their environment, and and also I thought it was very interesting to see how this helped uh, create a legal framework for restitution. So how the intangible can act and or can weigh in when you're talking about legal restitution for the, the people that suffered from this damage. Um, so now I'll introduce Dr. Ashraf. Ashraf, thank you so much for joining us. So Dr. Ashraf is a full professor at the Department of Engineering, Durham University, UK. His research focuses on ensuring infrastructure sustainability and resilience in climate change's impact on cultural heritage. He has led 11 global challenge research funds, Newton funds, and directed international projects funded by several UK research councils. And for example, he has been the, the principal investigator for the AARC project developing a novel climate change risk assessment framework for cultural heritage in Turkey, CRAFT, which we'll hear about it now. Dr. Ashraf, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And um, my whole year, um, uh, at the moment, I'm in Cairo, in Egypt, and uh, I struggle a little with the internet connection. I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, so... Um, um, uh, thank you for the introductions. What I um, will talk about today is um, one of our projects, uh, which is a global challenge, uh, which is funded initially um, under Global Challenge Fund, uh, which addresses global issues um, around the world. And um, uh, uh, can you show the start showing the slides because I can't see the screen? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so the title of our project um, is developing. Um, a novel climate change um, risk assessment uh, framework for cultural heritage in Turkey. Um, and um, yeah, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so this project is a partnership between uh, Durham University and several um, institutes in Turkey, including academic institutes um, like uh, Middle East Technical University, uh, in Ankara and Yeldiz Te Technical University uh, in Istanbul. And also we work with um, a couple of government agencies um, and uh, policymakers like Istanbul uh, Metropolitan uh, Municipality 
uh, and uh, with EFAD, which is a Turkish um, national disaster um, agency, because it's, um, we believe that um, when you address um, cultural heritage um, in uh, countries like Turkey, you need to uh, interact with different uh, policymakers. So it's not it's not just about um, academic collaborations, but it's um, the, the aim of this research is to try to develop like a, a policy document uh, which can be used by um, Istanbul municipality in uh, order to um, to address. Uh, the challenge associated with um, the cultural heritage in Istanbul and the climate change issues. Also, we work um, with the EFAD, the National um, Disaster Agency, uh, because they are the main um, governing body in Turkey, which deals with um, national disasters such as and, uh, landslides. Uh, and um, so if we go to um, the next slide, please. Um, so um, Turkey is one of the country which is um, one of the uh, most rich country in terms of um, archaeological uh, sites and cultural uh, heritage sites. And um, uh, if you go to the uh, UNESCO World Lit Heritage um, list, you will find um, 18 uh, sites uh, are located in Turkey and in their um, um, uh, and there is also additional 80. Uh, 85 locations in their um, uh, in their um, uh, uh, list, so that's um, uh, give you a clear uh, indications of um, the intensity and how uh, rich this country in terms of um, cultural heritage. And um, uh, just I want to um, to add, uh, we focus more on um, the tangible. Uh, cultural heritage rather than uh, intangible cultural heritage in uh, this size, mainly because of my um, area of speciality, because I'm I'm engineered by uh, education. Uh, but also we collaborate with um, different colleagues in this project, uh, different disciplinary. Um, so we, um, in Istanbul, um, it's um, one of the biggest city or the biggest city in Turkey with more than 15 million inhabitants. And also it had um, UNESCO. Uh, where literary sites, uh, which frequently um, suffer from uh, floods um, and um, landslide as a result of um, rainfall. Uh, and there is um, clear uh, indications of the impact of climate change on um, the frequency uh, of um, the rainfall and the frequency of the flooding, uh, uh, which uh, in which actually these sites are suffered from. And if you go, uh, if we go to the next um, slide, um, so um, according to the EFAD, uh, the National Disaster Agency in um, uh, the slides before, please. Uh, yeah, so um, flooding and landslides, uh, according to the National Disaster, Turkish National Disaster Agency are um, the most um, common or the most destructive type of natural disaster in Turkey. So they have um, many natural disasters, as you can. Uh, recently, the country suffered from uh, devastating um, earthquake, uh, but also, um, uh, yes, flooding and landslides still is the most uh, destructive form um, of natural disaster which affected Turkey. Uh, and just to give you an example and a flavor of um, uh, of the scale uh, of um, these natural disasters. Uh, so um, in August and September 2009, uh, 2009 in Marmara regions, which shows in the map, if you can see the map here, so it's an inner sea in Istanbul. Uh, so it had uh, suffered from um, severe flooding, 31 people lost their life and 30, uh, 5,000 people had um, been affected, uh, they had displaced from, lost their uh, homes or displaced from their home. And the economic loss in Istanbul alone um, is accounted for more than $100 million. Uh, and uh, there are uh, frequent um, flooding in recent years, which affected um, the Ben Syria or um, the historic site in Istanbul. Uh, in 2010, 2017, 18, 19. So, um, and then uh, the, particularly actually in uh, the deadly 2019 flooding um, triggered uh, several landslides, which affected several areas in um, 
uh, in Istanbul and affected and, and causes damage to uh, several monuments and, her- and um, heritage sites, for example, the Istanbul, Hagia Sophia, and small Hagia Sophia, and uh, uh, Chelebi mosques. This is one of the uh, famous um, landmark of um, Istanbul. Uh, next slide, slide. Uh, next slide, please. And um, again, just to um, to show how uh, rich actually Istanbul in terms of the cultural heritage. This is um, uh, what you see in the map is part of Istanbul. What we call this is um, historical Venezuela, uh, and the dotted lines. Uh, shows um, the sites or the locations of the creek. And the pink area is the UNESCO uh, cultural heritage site. So this is a UNESCO cultural heritage site. And in this research, rather than focusing on too many areas in Istanbul, because there are thousands of um, these historical sites, we just focus our attention um, to these pink areas or the UNESCO uh, cultural area sites. Um, and if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, yes, so uh, this is a, a historical uh, or the Venezuela, um, uh, historical Venezuela of um, Istanbul, where all of their landmark, famous landmark, Hagia Sophia uh, cathedrals and um, the Blue Mosque and other uh, cultural heritage sites. Uh, uh, next slide, please. And uh, the problem is not just with these frequent flooding. Uh, which affected and causes damage uh, to uh, landslide in the recent years, but also um, there is a uh, Istanbul. Actually, is one of the uh, European cities, one of the most European cities, which are vulnerable to climate change. And there is uh, clear indications um, right now, uh, which uh, indicate things and frequency of the flooding will become worse and worse in the future. And this is because actually it's um, uh, there is. Um, it had uh, highest uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission in Turkey, and um, in fact, actually, it's responsible of 10% of um, the greenhouse uh, gas emission of Turkey, which, of course, will cause several problems um, in terms of climate change. And there is uh, a lot of uh, there is um, a lot of studies which indicate there is possibility of occurrence occurrence of extreme uh, precipitations and flooding in the Marmara and Black. Uh, sea areas, um, and uh, this study shows um, there is an increasing trend uh, in the next um, uh, decades. Uh, so, uh, um, and and also there is um, the ten- the intensity and the free uh, the frequency of uh, both uh, rainfall and the resulting landslides and flooding um, had increased significantly. Uh, since 1997, and this is the main motivation for us to uh, choose Istanbul uh, cultural heritage in, um, in this project. Uh, next slide, please. So um, um, we are uh, luckily um, uh, to get funds from Arts and Humanity Research Council in the UK, um, which funded this project in two stages. The first stage uh, it started in uh, November 2020 and finished in the 2022. And then we are now in the second stage. So the main objective of um, this project is to evaluate landslides and flash flooding uh, and their impact on the world well cultural heritage in Istanbul. So we just focus um, in this project only on, um, on natural disaster, but only the, those natural disasters resulting from landslide and flash flooding, because they are these are the main causes for damage uh, for cultural um, heritage and historical site in Istanbul. And um, another thing is another objective of this project is to try to understand the impact of climate change on cultural heritage. How this climate change could impact. Uh, cultural heritage and one of the aim of this project is to try to identify which sites and cultural heritage and um, that could be affected uh, either right now or in the future uh, with um, um, with uh, uh, natural disaster and landslides and also um, we need to identify uh, sometimes when we, uh, when you identify which sites will be affected by um, land the slide, then we need to think of um, how we protect the site. Uh, but quite often, um, 
for many reasons, um, you you might reach a conclusion that you cannot protect these sites because of um, the difficulty and severity of the flood and there is uh, uh, or the high possibility of the damage. So it became impossible or not feasible to protect these sites. So uh, alternative of that and or um, these type of flooding can cause damage to um, these sites or uh, there is uh, inevitable or uh, the, or there is um, li little chance of avoiding the damage to um, landslide or to uh, this historical site. In that case, we need to think of uh, how you reconstruct these landslides. And one of the methods um, this project is trying to um, um, uh, is trying to address or trying to uh, to um, to research is how to rebuild or reconstruct these sites which had been affected by natural disaster in a way that it reflected um, the history of the damage or the natural disaster in uh, the modified asset. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so as I say, we um, uh, it's a collaborative project with AFAD and uh, metro um, and Istanbul uh, uh, Massibility and um, uh, Metro uh, Middle East Technical University and Yildiz Technical University in Istanbul. Um, next slide, please. So um, in this project, we had uh, different research methodologies. We applied, first of all, um, data collections and desk study. We spent quite a lot of time. You can see here these power um, research teams. Um, yeah, uh, did a lot of um, research on gathering that data from rainfall pattern, uh, flooding, landslide history, topography, soil properties. Um, and uh, ge uh, geographic information, and we process this data in GIS system analysis in order to uh, develop like a flooding and landslide susceptibility uh, mapping. So identify which areas will be affected by um, landslide and rainfall. So we spent quite a lot of time gathering a lot of informations, uh, historical informations, and we do a lot of uh, predictions. Um, in um, in order to identify uh, which areas will be affected by natural disaster. Um, the second part of our study is to try to identify um, heritage places that are at greater risk. And, um, and then we had a lot of meeting with um, uh, a lot of focus group and meeting, meeting with a stakeholder. Um, Yes, yeah, so we have a lot of meetings with the Missibility, um, uh, Istanbul Missibility, and also with uh, their um, heritage divisions, and also with the AFAT side, try to gather information, and also, as you know, um, assessing these sites, and also we, um, as we will see in the next slides, we um, we took um, a lot of this research with a lot of permission, permissions and paperwork in order to. Uh, to see and assess these uh, sites. And um, so in developing, um, um, so one of the philosophy on in this project in developing the consequences of the risk um, uh, of um, risk assessment framework is normal to presume that assets are irreplaceable. That means they are non-renewable resources. But as I say, in this project, we, um, uh, we assess uh, uh, this craft project we call it, this is um, uh, we assess the, uh, the we recognize the invisibility of the of the loss. So um, it's not just we try to assess the damage, but also we we try to recognize the uh, yes the uh, invisibility of uh, of the loss. So we need to add, to accept that some of these sites will be. Um, affected by or damaged by the landslide, and there is no way you can protect them. So, uh, um, so uh, we look at um, and we had a lot of discussions of um, with um, our um, stakeholders in um, identifying how um, you consider new form of uh, heritage and new ways of um, um, 
where you can reflect the history of the disaster in modified um, monument. So if um, damage had happened, how you can just reflect, accept this is damage and how you um, you um, recognize um, these, if you rebuild um, these sites, um, how you can rebuild them with, um, uh, and again, we can, um, rather than restoring them completely, you can also re reflect the history of the damage as part of, uh, it became part of the heritage and part of um, the modified monument. So it had to, um, we look at ways of how to reflect the history of the damage um, in uh, in um, the historical, uh, in this monument. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So, um, and um, deciding upon whether and how and how much and what kind of um, restoration, restoration is suitable depend on upon understanding of the values um, of the fabric of the monument and their link to social values. So there is a lot of discussions on how you identify, okay, which side you can accept it will be damaged and how, um, what kind of restorations you need to, uh, to do um, in this site. And those values actually um, differ. Uh, from different sectors of society um, and it affected also by educations and, and also we looked at um, how society or local people uh, look at the cultural heritage and what important for them so we consider also the public view and the view of um, the of the people and we find that also could be um, affected by the age by the educations by the difference uh, uh, by uh, different categories. And um, so we, um, our aim is to identify the view of the key groups uh, for major monument in Istanbul. And also we want to develop like a novel um, combined framework that bring together mapping uh, of risk um, to the monument. So identifying which areas will be affected by natural disaster, their likelihood, um, along with um, and uh, along with the assessment of the impact of those damage on uh, the cultural value of uh, the monument. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, in order to identify uh, the potential uh, measures, uh, by line this slide is a. Uh, we accept it's, it's very complicated issues because you need to uh, to do a lot of side investigations. As we say, uh, part of our uh, our study is just desk studies, but also is not just the desk study and gathering information, but also processing the information. Processing the information is need a lot of uh, knowledge, geographical knowledge, engineering knowledge. So we do a lot of we take samples of soils because actually, if you want to identify which areas affected by landslides you need to study the the ground and the soil you need to study the properties of the soil so you can identify okay this area will be affected most by flooding and in order to do that we uh, we do uh, we study the properties um, of the soil uh, water um, retention behavior how water interact with the soil so even we took samples of soil from um, certain locations and we do lab testings. I will not go to the details on that. So, but what I'm saying here, um, it's a bit of complicated issues in order to identify which areas could be affected by landslide. It need a lot of, um, um, a lot of investigations, a lot of uh, lab testing, engineering work, and uh, ground engineering work, um, uh, geographical informations in order to, um, uh, identify um, the soil I, I, I identify the soil properties uh, and we look at the topography uh, topographical uh, we did topographical analysis of Istanbul um, particularly the Istanbul historical areas so we look at the topography and uh, um, and um, identifying possible locations for um, land slides and um, we looked at existing literature field reports, um, and we are very grateful for the collaboration uh, from Istanbul uh, municipality. So they provide, they are very um, collaborative and very helpful. So they provide us with a lot of data. And um, as we say, we, we look also for scenarios of climate change. So we run like computer simulations. Okay, we, we feed up um, our 
soil data, soil properties, landslides, uh, rainfall data, and we run a lot of simulations with different scenarios of climate change in order to come up with um, uh, mapping or uh, hazard map for um, landslide. Um, so um, uh, one of the key objectives, I think, and achievement of this project, we produce um, suspectability map uh, for climate change driven hazard to cultural heritage. And if we go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, so um, uh, uh, just to give you a flavor, so we did a lot of analysis, geographical information, identifying different areas, different formulations of soils, and also um, uh, elevations and different um, uh, topographical analysis. Um, as you can see here, we produce these sort of maps. If you go uh, to the next slide, please. And, and we produce these sort of maps. So uh, flood density map mm -hmm. and landslide uh, hazard. So we identify, um, and, and you can see here, these, uh, the boundary here is um, UNESCO, um, World Heritage and uh, the map here from, uh, it had mm -hmm. scale from green to uh, red. So red areas of high uh, flood density here. Uh, in these cultural heritage, where it comes where it cultural heritage sites, you can see it will be affected, or we predict um, it can be affected uh, by uh, the floods, and we identify which areas could be affected by uh, flooding. Uh, and also, we uh, produce landslide hazard map, and as you can see here, uh, um, so we identify. And the locations of the flooding after um, all these sort of analysis and um, processing a lot of information and engineering data. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and once we done that, um, then we um, we went to have um, then we carried like a survey and field work um, just to see the physical. Um, uh, we create a physical assessment of uh, the landslide. So we identify areas which will be affected. And then we, we carry field work to look at uh, existing or uh, at um, the monument on historical site in these locations. So, um, and we identify in this project as 150 cultural heritage sites which could be affected by different natural hazards. And we produce um, like a a risk assessment uh, form, and we take us a lot of discussions in order to come up with um, a form like this. Um, after um, a lot of um, um, discussions and input from different stakeholders, and we looked at um, the historical data, so um, and the location, the settlement, and how um, and the structural. Uh, system, how the structures were built, so we can assess how it will be uh, if there is flood there or landslide, how this structure or this monument could be affected. Um, and also we uh, look at the current state, so ownership, um, preservation status, um, what sort of um, uh, intervention it carried on these sites, and we looked uh, at the physical conditions and um, the type of damage and to the uh, which currently uh, exists or it could be observed. And if we go to the uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. And you can see here, um, our researchers are very busy um, um, identifying or um, do a lot of observations and measurements of uh, the damage. And you can see here, um, this, there is a dark in the picture on um, the top left. You can see clearly there is effect or impact of uh, pre um, or uh, pre existing uh, damage conditions from flooding. You can see which is very clear uh, from um, the blue and the, uh, the, the dark um, uh, the dark color in the walls, that means there is water here or there is flooding there. And, and we compare actually with our observations with our predictions and our disk studies just to make, to do two things. First of all, to, um, 
to confirm um, or to um, be assured that our method of assessment is correct uh, or um, give us an accurate conditions. And also we use, and then we can develop further our models um, uh, to, um, and, um, and we feed our models with um, uh, future um, climate data and uh, future um, rainfall data and also to predict um, and use them um, uh, to predict um, in the long term how uh, the level of the damage and the extent of the damage uh, from uh, climate change on uh, the cultural heritage. So by identifying this study, uh, 150 uh, locations which could be affected by um, uh, by different da damage from landslide and um, uh, and flash flooding as a result of uh, climate impact. Uh, if we go uh, to the next slide, please. So, um, um, what we learned from this, this study, actually, is a field where data collection form um, that can be developed as part of this project can be used for other areas and other form um, can be uh, shared with stakeholders. We already had um, this project we carried in uh, to assess um, for our focus or study area in Istanbul, but we already got attention from um, different um, authorities uh, or different stakeholders in Turkey. We have uh, discussions uh, with, um, and we have uh, several meetings with uh, Borosa, uh, uh, with the um, city, um, the municipality of uh, Borosa, which is another uh, city which is uh, rich of landslide. They are interested to use uh, this form uh, in assess in uh, form which we developed to assess the damage. Um, so it got, uh, which it give us actually um, very good um, indications that the methods we developed can be used in other parts. And um, another thing is the methodology is applied into Istanbul, but it's uh, uh, which looks very promising because actually with our predictions and then uh, which had been confirmed with the field studies, um, we are uh, it gives us confidence the models we are uh, we develop and can give um, through reflections and good predictions of the extent um, of the damage to uh, landslide. So these models can be used in different. Um, areas and it could identify uh, critical areas and um, and then by identifying critical areas we can um, prioritize or um, uh, we can categorize um, the level of the damage uh, to the uh, cultural heritage that means um, the relevant authority can uh, make uh, their uh, plan and intervention plan and it can, we can help them in making decisions uh, by prioritizing uh, or putting priority uh, to the areas and by um, channeling um, their budget and the available fund to, add, uh, to, um, uh, to address or uh, to tackle the areas which are mostly or likely um, affected by um, landslides or by um, natural disasters. Um, and. Um, uh, and also one of um, the key achievements is this project, the data and the results were adopted by, which we are very proud of that, we are adopted by um, the Istanbul Municipality um, uh, Cultural Heritage Divisions and uh, we are very proud of the strong relationship and uh, which we develop with them over time and this is very good. Uh, um, I think this project is a very good example of collaborations between academics and policy makers and the stakeholders. Um, yeah, because they are very keen in um, our research and we are very pleased to see uh, some of the methodologies and the model we are using in case um, could have um, real uh, impact in um, and um, it could transform to uh, policy uh, documents and policy uh, plans. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, the other thing is um, what we learn from the desk studies, um, the data, um, which make us to think uh, of the, uh, the second phase of the project, because we collect a lot of data. Um, 
And then we realize actually there is a need for sharing this data and creating some sort of online platform. And this is what we are working on it at the moment um, to be available so um, different people can use it. It could be available to public, to researchers, um, so uh, which could have and it could be easily shared by different um, stakeholders because actually I don't know. Um, one, one of the problems we, um, we face in Turkey um, uh, with dealing with different stakeholders, sometimes it's uh, uh, there is uh, sometimes you feel there is a lack of communications um, and lack of transformations um, of the informations between the different divisions and different uh, government agencies. So um, this is what makes us think of creating some sort of online platform um, which could be available, um, uh, which we, where you can easily access um, data and information. Um, another thing is um, what we realize um, there is many areas with drainage uh, and related uh, problems. So some of um, the problem with the cultural heritage is not just the climate change and the impact of climate change and the rainfall, but what we recognize from our analysis and our field work, um, there is uh, uh, man-made problems. So sometimes um, there is um, destructions uh, or um, inefficient drainage system in the city or blockage of the drainage systems uh, which can um, cause uh, or can um, can make the problem of landslide worse because actually if you have if you don't have efficient drainage in the system uh, where in the cultural heritage sites that means uh, water will not be drained easily and could cause damage um, to landslide so we identify uh, some of the problem is not just related to climate change and rainfall, but also it could be it uh, become worse and accelerated uh, by uh, some of the, uh, by um, human uh, made causes. Um, and uh, another thing, what you, what we recognize is um, there is um, an important for raising awareness of the public. Um, and for different agency of the important uh, uh, about the importance of climate change and their impact on cultural heritage, um, because we recognize from our discussions and talk, uh, um, yeah, there's significant proportions of the public don't know. Uh, we carry also a lot of a um, couple of workshops and we carry uh, some surveys, public survey. Um, just to, to see or to measure um, the level of the awareness of the public. Um, so we uh, recognize there is there is a need actually for increasing the public awareness because a significant proportion of the public, they don't know a lot of, about cultural heritage and the risk to cultural heritage. Um, and, um, and also there is a need for more training and interactions, particularly for different agency, such as uh, National Disaster Agency and the Cultural Heritage, many years, um, uh, because we recognize there is some sort of um, sometimes progressive problems, sometimes lack of communication, sometimes lack of understanding of the level of the damage and uh, uh, the issues um, related to, or the extent of the issue related to uh, cultural heritage. Um, yeah, if we go to the next slide, please. So, um, yeah, learning from these lessons, um, what we have um, at the moment, uh, especially in the next stage, which um, just started a couple of months ago, what we are, um, we want to do, we want to carry a survey which aim to raise public awareness. Um, so we are planning to carry a wide survey um, online and in-person survey and colleagues we are um, and researchers who are working at the moment in designing this survey to um, raise the public awareness and uh, we want to create mobilize art and IT um, to uh, create some sort of um, narrative uh, uh, and, and, and make people awareness create some sort of short videos and um, other form of um, um, arts um, you, uh, facility or as art facilitators um, in order to raise the public awareness. And another thing which um, I just talked about is creating like a platform where we can 
uh, gather or share this information. We call this platform, which are, we are working on it at the moment, Istanbul uh, Heritage Forum to involve and uh, in this platform, online platform, we would also import um, uh, um, a lot of um, uh, local actors from communities, NGOs, um, institutions and education agency. Um, in order to uh, make easy to share information and facilitate um, uh, facilitate um, the decision making between um, the other um, the different agencies, so create like a, a unified platform where all the informations we uh, we gather there. And um, yes, yeah, so uh, uh, this is uh, just a brief. Um, uh, introductions about our projects and um, our research on cultural heritage. And um, I'm happy um, for any follow-up um, discussion. And thank you very much for, uh, again, for the invitations and for listening. Dr. Ashford, thank you so much. Um, I thought it was so interesting that um, although he's talking about um, tangible heritage, cultural heritage. There's so many things that resonated for me in talk. I mean, first talking about flooding and landslides, which is a huge problem in Brazil as well. But as he pointed out at the end, that these are man-made problems as well, just as the, the issue in Rio Doce with the disaster. So you have this, you know, how man-made uh, um, issues can affect or accelerate the uh, climate change problems. But I also thought it was very interesting how assessing damage in his, when, when he's talking about uh, tangible heritage, cultural heritage, uh, leads as well to an inevitability of the loss. But so accepting damage, but reflecting this damage on the history of that place. And I think that when Natalia and Mariana, they were talking as well about how the lives of the local communities were affected, but also understanding how they were affected by the damage and not just reconstructing what they were before without, you know, accepting the losses. And um, so, yeah, and, and also at the end, I think both projects they they talk about the same thing which is raising awareness for the damage and potential losses of cultural heritage so i thought that the two projects they might be different and in different countries but they they sort of meet at this point of raising uh, the awareness about restoration and how it depends on the cultural value either tangible or intangible what we're looking at um Maria, we have a few questions here already, but I was wondering if Mariana and Natalia, they have any comments, they would like to say anything regarding um, Ashraf's presentation. Yes, as you said, there are different projects in different countries. But I, what was really interesting is how memory and cultural values are essential in um, terms of reparation and reconstructing these areas. And as you said, we're not talking about recreating the past, it creates. So it's impossible to go back to what happened, how things were before the disaster, but there is a process of reconstruction which takes into account cultural heritage, memory, and specific values of those communities. This process gets better because it puts the um, lives of these people at the heart of this. And in Brazil, we're getting more and more disasters caused by flooding and landslides. It's more and more frequent and it's coming closer to our lives. So we need to look at this because 
um, obviously the intangible um, culture always sort of takes second place. So we need to look at this and we need to include this as well in our plans for prevention and mitigation. And this project could be really useful for us to guide um, some plans um, to deal with um, climate change risks in the future in Brazilian cities. Because we've, we still have a, a, leave a lot to be desired when it comes to this kind of prevention. The process is very slow in terms of working well with this. And finally, there are similarities in our methodology how to approach these lo locations, what they mean, how can they be reconstructed, and, um, you know, through conversations with different stakeholders. So those are my general um, comments. Thank you ever so much, Dr. Ashraf. If you could share the results and your reports, um, then we, we would really like to see them. We're very interested. Yeah, I'm, uh, thank you very much. And um, yes, I'm looking forward actually to um, look at um, you and, and collaborate with your um, uh, with you and your team because it's very um, uh, very impressive also the work you are you are doing. And as as you said, there is a lot of overlap and a lot of things um, which we can learn together by looking at um, different um, geographical area and different um, methodologies and how we apply them in different um, locations. Thank you so much. I will, um, we are sort of running out of time almost, but I'm going to make a question. And I think it's a question that someone has asked on YouTube. Um, but that reflects, well, that both um, projects could answer, which is what are the major factors that will prevent the findings from being implemented or acted upon? So in each case, what do you think are the you know, the main factors that prevent the findings? Is it, you know, public policy? Is it the actual, in the case of Brazil, I know that um, they probably uh, have a major issue with the, the company that runs the dam and 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 so forth. And, and in the case of Istanbul, what would be the impediments or the major impediments? Um, if you, if I started, um, yeah, there is two things I think we face uh, in this project. First of all, is um, sometimes the lack of um, getting the information as well. Um, I don't know how how the things is uh, working in Brazil, but what you recognize sometimes it's a bit frustrated uh, the bureaucracy and uh, getting the permissions, the paperwork, <laughs> dealing with different stakeholders. So there is a lot of um, um, there is a real problem of communications, which is could be very frustrating sometimes and very painful um, sometimes. So we need to uh, uh, maybe make people more in order to um, to make this research uh, useful and uh, um, and um, turn them to uh, real policies. We need to change the mentalities and and how. Um, Yes, how policymakers will look at um, how to deal with research and how to improve the communications between um, different departments and different agencies. Sometimes, so we, in Turkey, we have, for example, they have their um, disaster agency and they have um, and the cultural heritage sites uh, or the cultural heritage division. Sometimes you would be surprised, actually, they don't even share the information between these two governing bodies, which <laughs> which is a bit frustrating sometimes. So, talking about the dams where we've had results, I agree with you that there's a lot of bureaucracy. We were in a legal context, obviously, here. So, there was lots that we had to negotiate with the um, public prosecutor's office on federal and state level. So, so that 
you know, involved a lot of bureaucracy and also a lot of time was wasted with that. And the other thing is how to carry out this work simultaneously because there was another sort of legal process that was very significant, um, which was specifically in one region, but then expanded to the whole of the river basin. basin. And um, then we had to try and distance ourselves from this process because because this legal process had a lot of people involved, lots of companies. It's already difficult for these people who are affected, who are affected, talk about this disaster. But it's almost like we have to they end up repeating this because, first of all, one institution arrives to do one type of work, then another organization turns up. So you need to have a lot of care in how to approach these people. Some communities preferred not to speak to us. Uh, they wanted to, you know, follow their own routes, as it were. But this was something that we had to take a lot of care over. Time, of course, and, you know, resources, they're always a barrier. Um, we've um, been working for four years with more than 45 different local authorities, but um, I, I, because this dam was so huge, we had to decide to go to the most vulnerable people who were affected, and some of them didn't have internet or telephones, so um, we, I think Mariana already mentioned this, but we had a, a team that we organized to um, including technical experts to start that work. So what did these um, technical experts do? They, because they were local organizations, they already had an, an, a knowledge of that area. They knew the people who were affected, including the people who were perhaps more uh, most remote from us. And, and so that's how we started our work. So we had to deal with this difficulty, how we can approach these people. Um, so we had to um, have a lot of conversations, mobilize people a lot. We had to try and do it online as well, which was difficult. Um, so we offered them sort of data packages, as it were, so they could enter the apps and communicate with us. And this required a lot of money and resources so that before we managed to reach everyone. But despite this, we've managed to involve 45 different local authorities. Perhaps we could have gone to other communities, but anyway. Do you want to say any more about this, Mari? And so just briefly, um, these locations that Natalia mentioned. So in terms of trust, to, to gain their trust, you need, it's, you need to show that the work is serious and and you need to have like be very healthy in terms of your physical and mental health because it's exhausting work but because of this legal process this made things difficulty made more difficult rather and then um so there were lots of arguments over what is scientific this is talking about with the companies so, so some people say yes the water can already be is is ready to be drink um, is able to be drunk and then other people say no it's not so you get conflicting in information from different institutions so it makes it very complex 
but um, certainly in terms of the damages or the, the compensation being offered, it's very Muito well obrigada. below what happened. Thank you so much deserve. for your participation. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any further questions. We do have more questions here, but um, we're running out of time. I would just would like to thank very much um, Dr. Ash from Mariana and Natalia. It was um, it was a, uh, learning more about your projects and how with the similarities and the differences and how we could potentially uh, adopt Dr. Ashrib's methodology in Brazil as well, which I think um, there are possibilities. And uh, thank you all the team as well. Since this is our last webinar, I'd like to take the, the opportunity to, to thank People's Palace Projects team that have been involved in this, um, in this project also the translators that have been helping us here so that we can uh, achieve a greater audience of English speaking but Portuguese speaking as well. Um, our tech um, support as well with Igor. Paul, I don't know if you'd like to say a few words before we end here. I think you're muted, Paul. Can anyone hear Paul? It's just me. So you can consigo view Paul. No. <risos> Bom, eu vou agradecer aqui. Eu não sei se todo mundo conhece o probleminha aqui, mas assim, agradecer mais uma vez em nome da People's Palace Project. I don't know if you hear Paul, I had a problem here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Natalia, Mariana, Dr. Ashraf, and Paul. I'll speak in Portuguese now, but on Thursday, um, we will have another seminar once again with the FGV, with Natalia, Mariana, and Paul. We're going to talk a bit more about the methodologies used um, um, in the Hildo Sinkais de Residencia project, and all those. Um, in the, all the information is on the on PPP's website and also on the FGV website. It's going to be Thursday at 11 o'clock at the Memorial Getulio Vargas. And so whoever is available, it will be a pleasure to have you with us. And that's it. Thank you and a good day to all of you. <laughs>